You know, from a big picture perspective, the flight's an important test flight of uh, the Crew Dragon vehicle. And uh, we've got lots of uh, mission objectives planned, and I know Zeb's gonna go through some of those. You know, one of the big things on the flight uh, that we'll test out is, is the rendezvous system, which we did on demo one. Uh, for this flight, the crew is actually gonna take over and do a little bit of manual flying uh, on, uh, as we transition up to the V-bar. They'll take some control and make sure that the spacecraft can respond to their commands. And when we get up about 150 meters from the space station, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Binken will take over and, and do a little bit of manual flying. You know, we're gonna be testing a lot of the systems on Dragon for the, for the first time. We've got a great check out of the whole spacecraft on Demo 1, uh, but this time we're gonna check out the life support systems, uh, the spacesuits, the display system, and many other systems that Bob and Doug will, will need. And also the ability for the crew to live and work inside Dragon uh, on the way to space station and uh, also on the way back. You know, we're targeting right now a launch uh, on the 27th of May at uh, 4.32 Eastern time, the backup launch date would be a few days later. That's what we call a, a flight, day, uh, flight day two rendezvous, which means it takes a little less than 24 hours to get to the space station. The backup opportunity would be uh, on May 30th, a, a few days later. And again, that's another flight day, flight day two or 24 hour rendezvous, which is important for this flight. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've been working hard on for this flight is uh, the mission management team, and the construct is a little different than what we had in Space Shuttle. Uh, the mission management team is called the Dragon Mission Management Team. Uh, it's actually led by, by SpaceX. NASA participates in that mission management team. I'm the NASA representative for that mission management team activity. Uh, we have been practicing uh, over the last few months hand-in-hand uh, -hand with SpaceX uh, through uh, on-dock simulations, through rendezvous simulations, in fact, we will uh, have a team from JSC head down to the Launch Control Center on Monday, May 4th, and we'll do our final practice for launch uh, with the crew, the flight control team at Hawthorne, uh, the SpaceX control team for the Falcon, and then the NASA mission management team and SpaceX mission management team overall. I, I would say that's going really well. We have a strong partnership. We've established strong relationships. We've been work, working together for the last two years, and that's really what you want to see as you get close to space flight. And then finally, I would just want to say this is a really exciting mission for me personally. I've been working on this program for four and a half years, and I stand here today representing thousands of people within NASA and SpaceX across the country. I can't tell you how proud I am of the entire team. They're working long hours, uh, even under the COVID-19 precautions and virus uh, all across the country, all across various NASA centers, across all the SpaceX sites uh, to make sure that this mission happens successfully and safely, and it's just an honor to be part of that team. And I'll hand it over to Zeb. Great, thank you, Steve. So uh, as Steve said, this is just really an exciting day, and I'm enormously proud to, to be here talking about the, uh, the exciting launch and the mission we have coming up. You know, I think about uh, what, uh, the, what the world's going through now, and we're all missing our sports, our, our, our you know, baseballs and footballs and social gatherings. This is going to be on May 27th, like getting the World Series, the Stanley Cup, the Super Bowl all rolled into one when, when the Falcon 9 lifts off of the coast of Florida and, and heads towards the International Space Station. So I just can't wait for really all of America to come out and, and uh, watch what's going on in the um, uh, online, come and join us, come and watch the, the launch and watch the rendezvous and the mission. This is, just, this is going to bring it all together and get everyone to rally behind uh, what we've put together for this show. So a couple things about the mission. After the, the, the launch happens, that's going to be a, a really dynamic event with, with uh, a powerful launch on the F9 going up into orbit. That puts the crew in a safe orbit as they begin their rendezvous towards ISS. As Steve mentioned, that's about a two-day rendezvous to reach the, the ISS. So we'll be uh, uh, docking on the International Space Station around the 28th. During that free flight portion, there's several tests and checkouts that we'll be doing, including some manual flying demonstrations. They'll be uh, verifying the life support systems are working, the, uh, the crew habitation within that closed loop environment that we'll be uh, flying for the first time. As they approach ISS, we get into a close in a integrated operations uh, sequence where uh, the, the joint space station control team and the SpaceX control team works together to show uh, and, and complete the final rendezvous. I actually have a video that shows that sequence for those final uh, steps for the rendezvous. I'm happy to uh, roll that now. Okay, here you can see the uh, Dragon vehicle coming up underneath the space station. Uh, this is about uh, a kilometer below ISS. It performs a series of maneuvers to fly radially 
around to what we call the V-bar. This is the, the velocity vector that the ISS is traveling in, and that will align it uh, up on the docking axis aligned with the docking port. This video is, uh, is extremely sped up, so it, uh, it, it shows things in a, in a much higher speed, but the, the graphic itself is taken from one of the training and simulation runs that we did as a joint NASA and SpaceX team practicing this rendezvous event. As Dragon approaches the V-bar here, it will be about 250, uh, 220 meters away from ISS. You can see in the multiple camera views what, the, what one camera will be seeing as it, as it looks towards ISS out of the center of the docking mechanism. At this point, the crew is going to take manual control and do a manual flight test. This will be a, a capability that we're demonstrating should there ever be in the future a failure of the docking mechanisms of the rendezvous mechanisms, we're able to manually pilot in the Dragon spacecraft towards the ISS and complete the docking manually. Here, the, the crew will be demonstrating a series of, of translations and maneuvers in the Y and, and Z axis as they uh, really get, get some stick time flying the vehicle uh, manually versus the computer automated control. As that test completes, uh, the crew will then uh, pause the vehicle, put it into a hold state. The flight control team will then be able to transition Dragon back into an automated approach sequence, and it will begin uh, to resume its rendezvous towards ISS uh, once again. As Dragon approaches ISS at about the 20 meter point, there's a built-in hold where we do our final go, no-go checks to make sure we're ready for the final docking. You can see the Dragon here holding at about 20 meters. At that point, we proceed uh, from that, uh, that hold point for the final docking sequence after that go-no-go uh, verification has been given. At this point, this is all again under automated uh, docking sequence. There's a, a series of navigation sensors that control Dragon uh, to keep it perfectly aligned with the docking mechanism. And then uh, we have the final contact and uh, soft capture. From this point, the, the docking sequence uh, continues where we achieve hard mate and we have a series of hooks that drive to complete the final structural interface. We do a series of leak checks and repressurizations of, of the uh, joint atmospheres and get the crew happily onto ISS as a, as a joint integrated uh, ISS uh, uh, crew team. The, the, the mission at that point will uh, continue for a docked uh, period of time. That duration, uh, we actually have built in some variability to allow us to accommodate mission durations that best fit the needs of the ISS program as well as the commercial crew program to be able to uh, enable the, um, the balance of, of the ISS needs as well as the development and readiness for the crew on mission beyond that. During the docked time frame, there's going to be a, a series of test objectives we're going to be doing on the ISS. This is really to shake down and, and demonstrate that all of the preparations and the emergency capabilities we have built into this vehicle uh, have made it reliable uh, as a lifeboat in a contingency aboard ISS, and it's always there as a backup to be able to get the crew members down to the ground if needed, uh, but also a, as a reliable place to, uh, to ferry the crew members up and down on a regular and repeatable basis. At the end of the docked sequence, we'll have a, a a uh, series of events we'll do to prepare for the undock. This is going to be transferring some hardware uh, back onto Dragon, removing stuff off of Dragon, putting it back onto ISS. Then we'll begin the undock preparations. This will again be an automated undock. The crew will, uh, will depart station and have about a two-day uh, free flight sequence before splashing down safely off the coast of Florida. Uh, at that point, the recovery operations led by SpaceX will begin. They'll get them on the recovery boats and bring them back safely to the, to the Florida coast to hand back off to NASA. Uh, I just want to say that from an overall mission perspective, uh, this is really going to be an exciting day, and we're looking forward to, to a very successful mission. There's been a tremendous effort with the teamwork between SpaceX and NASA as really a joint integrated team to bring us uh, to this point. With that, I'd like to hand it back over to Benji. Hi there. Thank you so much for having uh, me on today. Um, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, um, you know we're, we're really here representing um, thousands of people, thousands of people here at SpaceX, uh, thousands of our partners at NASA, and all of our suppliers and vendors, and, and of course um, the American public and, and, and the public around the world. Everybody's super excited about this. Um, we're honored to be a part of uh, this uh, 
it's a historic event, um, and also it's a sacred honor to make sure that we are going to bring the crew, uh, take the crew up to space, bring them to the space station safely, bring them back home to their families. Um, you know, fundamentally, this is what uh, SpaceX was uh, founded for. Um, our goal is to take people to space to, to make life multiplanetary. And so this is a, a, an historic event um, in, uh, for our company as well. Um, we are closer than ever uh, now as we get ready to uh, bring uh, human spaceflight capability back to the United States for the first time since 2011, since the space shuttle was retired. Um, and as we've, as we've heard earlier today too, the criticality of this is not just that capability, but to actually help the space station um, stay fully operational. Um, and to help um, not only our space program, but um, the, the program um, of, of programs of many countries around the world who are involved in the space station and, and many countries who, who, who look forward to being involved um, as part of the space station. Um, really, this uh, endeavor is, is the culmination of not only years and years of experience uh, or of time and work, um, but you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of tireless effort to, uh, to bring us here. Um, and, um, and it's all focused, again, on you know, the safety and reliability of the system. Um, and when we talk about the system, um, it's important to understand a lot of times we focus on Crew Dragon, which of course is kind of the crown jewel um, and, uh, and, and, and what carries the astronauts. But there's really a whole system that, that runs um, you know, from, from the, the engineers and designs uh, and, and analysis that goes on through the factory and fabrication and all the testing. Um, um, and, it, and it all it involves you know, the Falcon 9 launch vehicle, the Dragon spacecraft, um, the operational teams and all the operational centers, um, and uh, and of course, um, you know, it's it's hardware and software and, and everything else that we that we put together. All of this has to be done correctly, has to be done well, super vetted with our partners at NASA. We're very grateful for their input and support, um, and and how we all work together to ensure that that reliability will be in place is is critical, and um, and so uh, we're excited, very excited to be here. Um, I think we're all very appropriately nervous and getting more so as we get close to, uh, get close to this day. Um, we are, uh, we're at 26 days from launch um, and uh, it's going to be, it's gonna be uh, quite, a, quite a show. Um, I think that it's important and I talk about some of the tests um, and some of the things that we've done. I've talked about there's a lot of these hours that we've put in. Well, you know, it's, we've spent um, over 700 tests of the Super Draco system. Um, the Super Dracos are the engines on Dragon that are used to carry Dragon away um, from, uh, from the Falcon in case there's a, an emergency need to escape Dragon from away, uh, away from there. Um, there's been thousands of tests on the Draco engines themselves. Um, today we're actually hoping to complete the 27th test of our Mark III parachute system, um, one of the most advanced parachute systems in the world. Um, and probably the most advanced um, space orbital return um, parachute system um, in the world and ever made. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's very exciting. Um, we've, we've actually performed over 80 tests um, of parachute systems um, for Crew Dragon and then many, many more for all of our parachute systems, including the ones that flew on cargo, um, uh, cargo Dragon um, under the CRS program. Um, on that note, we've had um, we've flown Dragon uh, to and from the space station successfully uh, 20 times for cargo missions, and of course, um, last year we had our demonstration one mission, um, which was the the Crew Dragon uh, without any crew on board, um, and uh, it went to the space station and uh, and, and and did uh, we did some tests there. Yeah, they opened up the hatch and um, and then came back home, um, landed beautifully. The whole. Uh, that, that whole process was um, kind of from start to finish just exactly the way we, we wanted it to be. We, we learned a lot from the flight um, and it's very important and exciting that we were able to do that before we fly Bob and Doug. Um, as we move um, as we move forward from that that test um, that test flight, we then did another very important test flight, which is the um, uh, in-flight abort test. Um, we did that back in January of this year, um, and that was actually a follow-up test from a pad abort um, test that we did a number of years ago, five years ago. 
um, that uh, in, in both cases it's where we, in, in the pad abort case, we have Dragon on the pad and we test that launch escape system to ensure that in case something goes wrong on the pad we can escape the, the crew uh, rapidly away from the pad um, and land them safely in the water. And in January we did the same thing in, um, I think, uh, it was probably one of the uh, the most complex engineering tests ever done, maybe in the history of the world, I don't know, but it was, it was amazing um, to see. We actually put Dragon on top of Falcon, launch the Falcon, um, and then initiate the launch escape system, um, um, kind of at this, at this peak moment of, uh, of loads on the vehicle. And, uh, and again, we demonstrated that Dragon is capable of, of carrying the crew away um, from uh, Falcon um, in the event of an emergency. Um, this, uh, th these tests are, are critical um, steps on the way to this upcoming demonstration two flight. Um, you know, this, this is also a test mission. Um, I think uh, in, in, a, in an earlier uh, briefing, um, Administrator Breidenstein made a, made a point, which is something I hadn't realized beforehand, which is um, this will be only the, the fifth time in the history of the United States, and I think the ninth time in the history of the world, that uh, crews have been, that the humans have flown on a brand new um, uh, space system, uh, space flight system. And that's, uh, that's a big deal. That's really, really cool. And again, it's, a, it's an honor and a sacred honor that I know that um, all of us here at SpaceX and um, uh, all of our partners that we've been working closely with at NASA take, take very seriously. Um, and we're excited to be a part of it. Um, as part of that effort, uh, we have uh, been working closely with the crew and all of our operations teams. They put in thousands of hours, literally um, thousands of hours of training and simulation time, um, um, even uh, and at least a couple of thousand just directly with Bob and Doug involved um, in the loop. And, and I think we have a video that we want to bring up and talk a little bit more about um, what's going to happen um, as part of the training that we've done and also what's going to happen on the day of the launch. We can bring that video up now. Um, you can see, uh, as you've seen on some of this video, there's um, Bob um, Bankin and Doug Hurley, who are our uh, um, astronauts who will be flying with us on this demonstration mission. They um, have jointly executed um, uh, many, many simulations, like I said, a couple of thousands of hours of worth of training and simulation time, um, and, and have been working closely together um, uh, and with our team um, on all of this. Um, and um, uh, we are... Uh, um, uh, looking forward to, to actually the, the, the day of the launch itself. Um, on that day, it'll be on at about 4.32 uh, p.m. Um, Eastern time, we'll, uh, we'll launch, launch the, uh, the crew. A few days prior to that, we'll have done a, um, um, uh, a series of what we call first of our static fire test. Um, that's where we have Dragon and, and Falcon um, integrated and standing on the pad. We hold Dragon, uh, we hold the vehicle down as we um, initiate uh, the Falcon engines. And, um, uh, and, and, and make sure that basically do a quick check of all the systems, make sure everything's looking great. We're also going to do what we call a crew dry dress um, rehearsal where um, Bob and Doug will get into their suits um, at the ONC building at NASA and they will um, get ready to uh, um, uh, get into the vehicles, um, come to the pad, go up, go, go across the pad arm. The, the pad crew will be there uh, supporting them as they get into the, the Dragon and we'll, they'll get into their seats, Dragon will get closed up and um, they'll get all in place. And so we'll basically run that whole sequence um, up to the point of where we were going to launch. We'll do that as a, what we call the crew dry dress rehearsal. Um, and then um, um, on the day of the launch itself, um, uh, it, the, the, the process is the same. We'll have practiced it in the rehearsal about four hours before launch. Um, the crew will get ready to go. Um, uh, about three hours before launch, there they'll be getting transported to the pad, um, and then we uh, we get ready to go through uh, through the launch um, uh, process. And uh, and from there, um, it's uh, it, 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 it's uh, a lot of the similar kind of thing that we do normally for uh, for launches. Um, you know, we the, drag, the the goal of our systems are always to have. Um, you know, dragons fly and falcons fly as consistently and repeatedly um, as possible, whether we're flying crew or not, um, and that adds a lot to the safety and reliability um, of the system. Um, and I think that we have a, uh, um, a infographic that we're going to be bringing up that talks a little bit about what it looks like um, after we launch. Um, and uh, you can kind of get a sense here if you look at this infographic as to 
what it looks like um, from launch and what the series of events are going to be. Um, I think that probably kind of the, some of the key takeaways from this are going to be that we have, uh, um, you know, once in orbit, um, the uh, the crew is going to be taking and, and doing a number of, of tests and and uh, of, uh, various um, uh, demonstrations that they're going to be doing in the system, the things that they can control, um, and things that uh, we need to check out in terms of the life support system and and other things that they'll be they'll be looking at in there. Um, I think that we have a, another infographic that we'll be bringing up. Um, this is uh, talking about as we approach um, space station, and uh, and you saw Zeb's uh, uh, video earlier that gave you another view of how that looks as Dragon approaches space station and gets ready to dock. Um, and um, and then there's one more graphic that I think we'll be bringing up, and this is uh, for return. And I'm um, going to talk a little bit about this in a little bit more detail. So um, Dragon will be um, departing um, from uh, Space Station. Um, and uh, again, similar to the approach, um, Dragon um, was, is fully autonomous. And um, the crew will be able to um, take control to do manual piloting if needed in an emergency situation. But otherwise, it's fully autonomous. And as, it, as Dragon leaves Space Station, it'll get ready for its reentry. Um, and um, of course, it'll jettison the trunk, as we always have done with the cargo dragons, as we did for the demonstration one flight last year. Um, and then it'll uh, come home, re-enter, and, um, and deploy the parachute system, uh, the same parachute system that I mentioned we're going to be doing our 27th and final test of the Mark III design today. Um, and uh, and, uh, and as we, as we de deployed for the demonstration one mission last year. Um, and so once the crew is uh, returned um, to the water safely, um, in, in less than an hour, our recovery forces will actually have um, acquired the Dragon um, and brought it up onto uh, the recovery vessel um, and we'll have the crew out of the Dragon. All of that in less than an hour after, uh, after splashdown. Um, that really wraps up what, uh, what the whole um, mission uh, looks like. And, uh, and from there, I think I'll hand it back over to Steve. Yeah. I, this is Brandy. I can take it from here. We're going to go next to some questions. So again, press star one on the phone to let us know if you have one. And on social media, using the hash, you can use the, the hashtag AskNASA. Um, our first question is going to be from Lauren Grush with The Verge. And Lauren, please remember to direct your question to the person you'd like to answer it. Uh, great. Thank you so much for taking my question. I think this is for Steve. Um, I'm really curious to hear more about the extended mission. When was the decision made to make this an extended mission? How did that change the training for the astronauts? How long will they be staying? When do they come home? What will they be doing? Just more info about that would be great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, good question, Lauren. So uh, we made a decision to uh, have this capability to fly a longer mission. Uh, it was probably about uh, six months ago or so when we started talking about it, Lauren. And the vehicle has the capability to fly um, pre-mission. Our predictions are about 119 days, and that's based on the solar arrays. The atmosphere degrades all solar arrays in low Earth orbit over time. And, and so the solar arrays on Dragon, we'll watch them carefully to see. The idea behind it was uh, we started looking at when we might be flying this mission and the needs of the space station program. And there was a bit of a need to have Bob and Doug uh, augment the capability of station. So we looked very carefully at all the vehicle systems at the time. Uh, this Dragon vehicle is designed, except for the solar arrays and a few other components, to meet that typical 210-day uh, mission requirement for us. And so we decided, hey, it's smart to go ahead and extend the mission uh, and have Bob and Doug be on station a little longer. Uh, Bob and Doug did get additional training, uh, and Kirk may have talked about it already earlier today, but they got some additional training on the space station systems. In fact, Bob went in and did even a few um, uh, neutral buoyancy lab runs to practice for spacewalks so they, he, they can help augment the station crew. Uh, when we get on orbit, uh, we'll again look at the vehicle systems and how it's performing, how dragging's doing. Um, we'll be looking also at the readiness for the Crew-1 mission uh, later this year. And then uh, at a time during the mission, we'll decide exactly how long we'll, we'll fly the mission. Okay, next we'll take a question from Mark and Vingo, who is with the SpaceX Reddit group. Uh, 
Uh, Martin, can you hear us? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have a question for Benji. Um, what are the differences in the launch criteria between normal cargo launches, uh, weather, et cetera, and man launches? Do you anticipate a higher risk for weather-related scrubs? And will there be any impact on the re recycle time between launch attempts? Thank you. Understood. That, that's a great question. Um, and certainly we do expect uh, more, a, a higher risk of weather-related scrubs on this mission. You know, when, when you're doing a standard Falcon flight, you have all of the, the launch criteria that you look for for being able to, to, to launch a Falcon. Um, when you add Dragon into that mix, there's um, an additional set of launch criteria that you, that you worry about that are particularly weather-related. Um, and then with the crew um, especially, we need to think about in the case of an emergency, if they needed to, to uh, bring the Dragon home, you know, either in a launch escape um, scenario from uh, you know coming off of Falcon, or even after um, it uh, after uh, Dragon is on orbit um, and it needs to come home very early um, in the mission cycle, we need to think about the weather along the track of where Dragon could come back down um, as well. And so we actually are looking across not just the local weather um, or even the getting to orbit weather, but also where Dragon would need to come back home. Um, and so the combination of, of that, um, of, of all of those constraints put together, certainly I would expect there to be um, um, a, v a very high chance of scrub um, due to weather. Um, and given the time of year, it wouldn't surprise me as well for, the, for that. Our next question is going to be from Mark Mancini with How Stuff Works. Hello there. Um, I believe this question is for Zeb. I was wondering if you could speak to the space suits that are going to be worn on this mission and whether or not SpaceX was involved in their design. Yeah, this is uh, something that, that Benji can speak to very well as, as well. This is an entirely uh, SpaceX developed suit and it's uh, designed to protect the crew members uh, in case of loss of atmospheric pressure. So it's a full pressure suit that they wear during the, the ascent portion. We also have the crew members don it and do leak checks prior to the, the docking and the undocking, and then eventually the re-entry. Um, but uh, this was entirely a, a new build, new design by uh, the SpaceX company. Okay, next up we will take a question from Kenneth Chang with the New York Times. Hi, thank you for taking my question. So this is for Mr. Reed. I was wondering, after certification work is done, what happens to this Crew Dragon? Is it going to be used for an Axiom flight? Great. Uh, that's a good question, too. You know, Dragon um, has been designed for, uh, for reuse um, and reflight. Um, up to five times, um, similar to our, our Falcon vehicles. Um, not only do we refly Falcons um, for many missions, but we also refly um, Dragons already. Um, the Dragon 1 line for cargo under CRS has uh, a number of those have flown more than once and even more than twice um, to the space station. Um, we intend um, for uh, Crew Dragons to also be able to be fully reusable, um, and, um, and, and this Dragon itself will be brought home and, uh, and refurbished and, and made ready for a future flight. Um, I can't speak to exactly which flight it'll fly on. You know, we're always assessing our, our manifest and based on schedule and readiness um, and, 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 and what, what timeline meets for our customers, um, but certainly all of the Crew Dragons, um, our intent is to, is to refurbish them and, and be able to refly them. Thank you. Next, we are going to go to Daniel Oberhaus with Wired. Hi, yes. Um, I just had a uh, quick follow-up about the solar arrays. Can you uh, tell me, uh, Steve, a little bit about what specifically limits uh, Dragon's time on orbit uh, relative to the solar panels? And I was hoping, Benji, you could also tell me how the manual control on Dragon differs from that in Soyuz, because it's quite a unique uh, control panel from what I can tell. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the solar arrays and then let Benji talk about the manual uh, piloting capability with the new touchscreen displays. Uh, the solar arrays themselves, any solar array in, in low Earth orbit tends to degrade a little bit over time. It turns out the atmosphere has a little bit of oxygen in it. It's called atomic oxygen. And so there's a, a little bit of degradation in the ability for that solar array to the cells itself to generate power. And uh, the particular cells on the, the trunk for, of Dragon 
based on analysis capability, kind of a worst case prediction, we, we think we can get about 120 days capability out of those. What we'll do in flight is you can, we have this curve of what we expect that degradation to be over time. And we can kind of look at the, the power that the arrays generate um, each day and kind of plot that against this prediction and, and that can, can give us the overall total capability. So that's really what's going on with the solar arrays. We looked at the rest of the vehicle. We don't see any other life limiters. We looked at the pumps uh, on the uh, thermal system. Uh, we looked at the propulsion system, all the other components. Uh, when we talked about extending the mission and, and the solar arrays are the only one really that, that has a little bit of a poke out. And so we'll just kind of watch their performance in flight and uh, be able to make a good decision about how long to stay, uh, stay docked. And I'll let Benji talk about the touch screens. Sure, absolutely. You know, um, Crew Dragon is a 21st century spacecraft, um, and uh, and we, we wanted it to to not only um, you know be as safe and reliable and, and uh, as you'd expect from um, you know the most advanced spacecraft in the world, um, and and to be one of if not the most safe uh, spacecraft in the world. But we we also wanted to, to 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 look amazing and look beautiful. I mean, spacecraft and space flight should be inspiring. Um, we need to be excited about um, moving um, into space, um, and, and, and I think the Dragon design does that, and, um, and certainly um, the, the, the look of the control system does that, um, but, but, but more importantly, the control system is um, technologically um, a, a, a modern feat of engineering. Um, and it relies on, on many different systems um, that, that exist for uh, touchscreens that we use uh, all the time, um, all the time now in, in our lives um, and in, in an industry. Um, and, and so one of the biggest differences that you see, of course, is that you know, from a traditional cockpit you know, designed many decades ago where you have many switches and knobs and dials, um, inside of Dragon you have um, these, these uh, large touchscreens um, that allow you to do um, most of the, the data reviewing and, and all of the data reviewing and all of the information that you gather from the vehicle and also um, quite a bit of the control. Um, there are a few um, actual manual um, switches or knobs that you need um, just in, the, um, for in case of emergency um, or convenience, um, but otherwise it's all touchscreen controlled. Um, and the crew, of course, has um, put in many hours um, practicing and, and, and using those systems um, for, uh, for getting ready for flight. Um, again, uh, Dragon will be fully autonomous. The expectation is that it can carry the crew safely to uh, the station and bring them home um, without direct intervention. But, um, of course, we want to make sure that we give the crew all the tools possible um, in case they need to um, uh, manually pilot um, or, or manage Dragon's flight. Um, and so they're able to do that. Okay, we're going to take a couple questions from social media now. I think this one will be for Benji as well. Trevor from Twitter is asking, who will the Capcom be for the DM2 mission? And I know that's a little different than we usually do it. That's a great question. And actually, I'm going to throw that one back over to Zeb because his team, he can talk a little bit more about what Capcom is for folks who may not know what that is. And then also um, a little bit about how we're integrating with um, our team and the, and the NASA team. Yeah, so uh, there's a, a new capability that uh, differentiates the uh, Crew Dragon vehicle from previous Dragons and that with the crew on board, they now need uh, the, the communicators on the ground uh, to support them. And so the Capcom uh, role itself goes back to the old uh, Mercury days with a, the capsule communicator was always an astronaut that would be able to talk to the crew and, and share the perspective of the ground and be able to uh, tie the onboard crew with the, with the ground team as well. Uh, we still have the, the Capcom position flying the International Space Station every day and we'll continue to, to have a uh, specified Capcom lead um, for the uh, upcoming Demo-2 mission on the NASA side. Uh, new to this mission, SpaceX has a um, corollary position, they're calling it CORE, and uh, the CORE is the, is the individuals responsible for talking to the crew members throughout the mission. And so uh, they have a, a team of cores, which I have trained on all the various phases of the flight. And so there's 
There is a core supporting for the ascent phase, a different one during the rendezvous and docking phase, and then another one during the undocking and, and splashdown phase. All the, the core team has been trained uh, well to be able to cross-train to support other phases of flight. And, uh, and uh, we've been working closely with them to make sure that we're uh, sharing our experience and, and learning from each other to make sure that, that we're providing the crews the information they need, both in the nominal mission and in the contingency uh, cases as well, should they arise. Thank you, Zeb. Uh, we're gonna try again for one for Benji. Uh, this is uh, coming in actually from a lot of people on, on uh, many different uh, platforms wanting more details on the uh, the spacesuits. Uh, they want to know what more about their features, uh, when they're used, when what they're made of, and are they comfortable? <laughs> um, uh, so the spacesuits are uh, again another piece of. Um, uh, of the important equipment and really a subsystem of the vehicle um, that is critical for crew safety. Um, um, fundamentally, we call these flight suits. Um, as I think Zeb mentioned earlier, these are these are you know these are not the the suits that you see people using outside for what you call extravehicular activity. These are suits that are designed to keep you safe while you're still in the vehicle, in case there's um, a loss of uh, atmosphere. Um, uh, or, or something else is, is happening inside the crew, in, inside the vehicle, where you need to ensure that the crew has the right amount of uh, atmospheric pressure or temperature, um, oxygen supply, those sorts of things. And that's what the suit is for. Um, the suit is um, is, a, is a one piece suit essentially. Um, you know, we, we we looked at a lot of the different kinds of things um, in in previous flight suits. Um, and tried to make some um, of the adjustments um, that we thought we could to, to really make this an advanced flight suit, as, as advanced as possible. Um, some of those things include the fact that it is one piece so that you can, you don't have pieces of your, of your suit kind of floating away, a glove floating off and getting lost, that sort of thing. Um, and, um, and then uh, you, you use the suit, again, um, as, as mentioned, um, during kind of these critical phases of, of flight. Um, we want to make sure that um, that kind of where your highest risk or maybe something you might need to, to control for in the atmosphere, um, they've got their suits on and ready to go. Um, so of course that includes launch. Um, and then um, when you're on orbit, they'll actually do some practice with the suits as well. Um, as you're approaching space station, getting ready to dock, um, they'll have the suits on and again, they'll put them on um, as they undock um, and when they come home, um, when they're coming home for splashdown, they'll have the suits on. Um, the suits provide air, um, uh, oxygen supply, they maintain pressure, um, they can, they'll maintain the, the right temperature um, for the crew. Um, the suits also have an integrated com uh, communication system so that uh, the crew can communicate through their, um, you know, through their helmets um, as they have their helmets on. Um, and then and the suit really is an integrated um, system of Dragon. Um, it plugs into um, the seat. Um, as, when, you know, when you're sitting in your seat with your suit on, you actually plug in. Um, and similar to flight suits um, in past systems, that, that, that does the same thing. And, and when the crew is not in Dragon and they have their suits on, they also have a, um, they can plug into a device that they carry. Um, the suits um, are really kind of two major um, uh, layers. Um, there's what we call the bladder layer, and that's the layer that that um, that that does the the, the containment of atmosphere um, and uh, and pressure. And then there's the outer layer, um, and that outer garment um, kind of really serves um, two purposes, of course, it could, or three purposes really. It holds the whole suit together. Um, it's a, f uh, a fire resistant layer as well, um, to keep the crew safe in the case of fire emergency. Um, and then, of course, it looks cool. And again, um, just like uh, the interior of Dragon, it's important that the, the suits um, are comfortable um, and, and also are inspiring. Um, as we see, uh, see the astronauts walk out to the pad and, and be in their vehicle and, and do everything that they do in the suits, um, it's something that we want to make sure is, um, is very inspiring as well. But above all, it's uh, designed to keep the crew safe. Absolutely. We're going to go back to the foam bridge now and take a question from Mike Brown with Inverse. Hi, sorry. Uh, my question is for uh, Benji. Um, uh, I would like to know, in uh, in terms of the spacesuit, um, how much of uh, the design will help inform uh, future missions, uh, like the Golden Manned mission on Mars? Uh, how much uh, modification would it require before supporting these sort of missions, and will it serve as the uh, basis for these sort of future missions? 
Sure, you know, um, the, the suits themselves are designed particularly um, for use within Dragon um, and, and as our focus um, on, you know, transporting NASA crew um, to and from the space station. So that's, that's our number one focus um, for the suits today. Um, but just like all systems on Dragon and Falcon and, and, and everything else that we do here, um, we're, we, we've de designed and developed them based on knowledge of, of all the past systems that, that have been developed and designed by others. Um, and then we take the designs um, and results of our work and the, the data that we get from test and actual flight to feed into future work. So as we look towards the future, certainly we'll be, we'll be taking what we learn from these suits and getting the data from it and, um, and, uh, and applying that for, for future missions. Next up, we're going to go to Marina Corin from The Atlantic. Hi everyone, hope you're well. Uh, this is a question for Steve. Um, could you please talk a little bit more in detail about the specific uh, precautions that NASA employees are going to be taking as they prepare for the launch? Um, for example, on the day of the launch, will you be advising people in the control room at Cape Canaveral and other sites to be staying six feet apart and to wear face masks? Yeah, that, good, good question. Obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are taking extra precautions uh, for uh, all the teams supporting the, the launch in all phases of flight. So uh, in the various control rooms, we've uh, laid out those rooms to have at least six feet between anybody on, on a console looking at displays. Uh, we go in and, and clean those rooms ahead of time with sanitizer and make sure that they're, they're sterile. We have hand sanitizer available for all the employees. And, and I know Benji and the SpaceX team are taking all the same precautions. Uh, we have masks available for those employees. So we're going through all those precautions uh, uh, that uh, anybody would do uh, uh, with the virus. And, and then in between shifts, we make sure we, we clean things uh, for the next individual group of, uh, of flight controllers and operators. And they're doing the same thing in the Mission Control Center. Zeb could, Zeb could talk more about that. And I know Benji and the SpaceX team are doing the same thing. Uh, any crew training, there's been a lot of precautions taken as well uh, for the, any individual that needs to get close to the crew, uh, various medical checks to make sure that they're, they're well and healthy, uh, and the appropriate mask, gloves, and so forth. So we've been taking those precautions. We've been practicing those. Actually, we'll practice um, with this uh, launch simulation that we're going to do uh, on May 4th, on Monday. We're going to go through and use all those precautions. And we did a sim back in mid-April where we use those precautions as well for all of our employees. And, uh, and even we have some employees that, that can support remotely based on the modern technology capability that we have. So, uh, so far it's worked well and we don't really see any impacts to how we're gonna operate uh, on launch day or rendezvous day or any other part of the flight. Now we're gonna go to Charles Fishman, who is with Fast Company. Hi, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, a quick follow-up on uh, spacesuits and then a, a, a spaceship question. Um, somebody said in passing that SpaceX had designed the spacesuits. All the spacesuits that, that U.S. astronauts have used since Apollo have been made by ILC Dover in Delaware. Did SpaceX, A, consult them, and did SpaceX build these suits or, or, or manufacture the suits themselves? And, and Benji, on the, on the spaceship itself, you talked a little bit about the touch controls, but give us a little more uh, sense of the spaceship as a spaceship. It, it really is the first spaceship design in 40 years in the United States. A lot has changed since shuttle. Um, how did, you know, things like uh, life support, um, uh, the way the spaceship maneuvers, the way it navigates. Does this ship use inertial navigation? Does it rely on, on the network of GPS um, satellites? T tell us a little bit about what was interesting in taking a clean sheet of paper and designing an all-new spaceship in a completely different era. So space and spaceship. 
Sure. Um, I understood. Uh, you know, so I think um, uh, number one, um, in terms of the spacesuits, I, I, I can't really say exactly who specifically we may have consulted or not. I know that we worked very closely with NASA, um, and we also uh, relied, um, uh, you know, again on, on on the many years of of spacesuit design experience and practice, um, you know, uh, from around the world. Um, uh, and we did build the spacesuits here in house, um, just like uh, many things. We uh, we outsource um, many of our, our components and piece parts. We have, you know, we're actually thousands of vendors and suppliers that uh, that we're honored to have supporting us here at SpaceX. Um, uh, and then, but we do do the integration work. Uh, we actually have a great team of, of soft goods um, uh, uh, personnel, um, engineers and technicians who, who are who are busy working all the time building the various uh, what we call soft goods uh, for for the vehicle and for the systems, including the spacesuits. Um, and it's been an exciting journey as well. Um, it, it, as much as everything else, watching the spacesuit design evolve um, and get tested, um, a huge amount of feedback from the crew directly, Bob and Doug, um, and even some of the other astronauts from um, the crew office have been directly involved for a number of years um, in our spacesuit design um, and giving us feedback in terms of comfort and performance and mobility. Um, and that's been a great partnership to see that come together. In terms of uh, the spacecraft uh, itself, uh, it maybe just a little bit more of an overview, um, give you a sense of it. Uh, you know, there's there's four seats um, uh, in this version of, of Crew Dragon. Um, there's uh, they, they go across in a row. Um, there's um, there's some windows that people can look out of um, as they as they as they're flying um, and also as they come approach the space station, um, see the Earth and, and also see the station. Um, there is uh, the touchscreen panels that I talked about. Those are um, basically when you're seated in the center two seats for the pilot and commander, you'll you'll look up and you can and you can touch those touchscreens and, and see them there. Um, below the uh, the seats is uh, our, our pallets, what we call pallets, where we can put in um, cargo, um, and we will be carrying cargo on this mission. Um, we carried cargo um, on the last mission, the Demonstration 1 mission. We'll be carrying cargo on Demo 2 for the space station. Um, you know, that's, that's uh, very critical to have the staff um, and um, people leading and running and managing the space station, but also they need all the, the stuff that, to, to do that. Not only just food and water and supplies, but the experiments and the science. And uh, Crew Dragon, similar to Cargo Dragon, will be able to carry um, powered lockers or powered um, basically freezers and, and refrigerator units that um, that are um, specially designed to carry certain life science and other other experience other experiments um, that go up on Dragon. That a lot of those are time critical and temperature critical, um, and so we'll be carrying those as well in, in that cargo area on Crew Dragon. Um, as well as um, the, the cargo area, there's just a ton of little cubbies and, and, and places where um, people put uh, different things. There's, there's crew supplies, of course, food and water, um, um, and then also uh, personal uh, supplies that, that the crew can bring up, um, their personal belongings. Um, they have a stowage for that. Um, you know, Dragon, as it functions, um, is, is building, um, again, on, on decades of heritage um, for the, the capsule-type spacecraft. Um, and, uh, and and then and, and of course our many many missions and, and many years um, on the cargo resupply vehicle, the, the Dragon One line, um, and which has flown many times. And similar to Dragon One, uh, Crew Dragon has um, uh, you know the Draco thrusters, and that's our primary control for um, for for moving around in space um, when you're on orbit. As I mentioned, uh, Crew Dragon also has the Super Dracos for the launch escape system. Um, and those are those are some of the, the, the key aspects of, of Dragon. Um, there is a nose cone. Um, a cool a cool thing about Crew Dragon um, and Dragon Two in general is that the nose cone actually um, it opens um, for uh, for docking, and then um, when we undock, it actually closes and returns. It's not jettisoned. We'll uh, we'll come home with uh, the nose cone as well and fully reusable there. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left, so if you can uh, limit your questions to just one part, um, that will help us get through more, more of the request. Next up, we're going to go to Alan Boyle at GeekWire. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, time frame for um, extended mission. Uh, you've talked about 119 days as perhaps being the maximum. Uh, can you um, can you tell me what the minimum versus the maximum are, and, and what the decision timeline might be? Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll address that question. So the, the the minimum mission duration is really about a month. Uh, 
And the maximum, as I talked about, is 119 days. And we're really, again, trying to do both a test flight with this vehicle and also have the vehicle docked to station to allow uh, Bob and Doug to augment the, the station crew. And really, the decision point is, hey, is Dragon healthy? Is the vehicle performing well? The Dragon that's on orbit? And then we'll be looking ahead to that next mission, the Crew-1 flight, and looking at the vehicle readiness and trying to determine, hey, what's the smart thing to do relative to the, the mission duration? So uh, again, it's a little bit of a variable, but it's one that I think we can manage well. Uh, and uh, we've been talking to the space station program about this in the commercial crew program in SpaceX, and I think we're all on the same page as we would we would like to fly um, a, a mission that is as long as we need to for a test flight, but also support some of the space station program needs and augment their crew capability to do uh, uh, science and uh, other operations at station. You know, once we're docked, the the, the risk. You know, if you look at the risk in space flight. The risk in general is two big parts. It's the launch phase and then the, the landing phase. And so once we're, once we're docked to space station, we can wake the Dragon up uh, once a week and check the systems out and make sure everything's healthy and, and then look at the solar ray performance and then decide when to, when to return. All right, thank you. Next, we're gonna go to Ivan Caron from AFP. Thank you very much. Uh, a question for Steve Stitch and Benji Reed. Uh, how many people from the NASA and the SpaceX teams have had COVID-19 or have been in quarantine so far, if any? Uh, boy, I would not know that. I would not be able to tell that data from a NASA perspective. I know we have, we have had employees and contractor employees with COVID-19. I, I really wouldn't know that number. We can check on that uh, and get back to you for, on that question, Ivan. Let's go now to Andrea Leinfelder from the Houston Chronicle. Hi, um, I just wanted to get a little more information on when it's going to be manually controlled and when it's going to be automated um, when you're like docking with the space station. And also, sorry, if you could clarify how many days it will take to get there and to land. Thank you. Andrea, thank you. I can. I can take that question pretty well. The time to get uh, from the launch to docking is a little bit variable. Uh, for the, the May, June timeframe, we're looking at about a two day rendezvous. It's actually about 19 hours to be able to get there. But as the, the space station is, is moving around the earth, the distance and the, the, what we call the phase angle between that and, and the Cape in Florida is variable. And so uh, the Dragon has the capability to get to space station a little bit faster. They can even get there on a one day mission or in some cases a, a three day rendezvous profile. And that just uh, will be variable based upon the particular uh, day that we choose to launch. And the same is true coming down as well, that, that time to get the crew down. We're trying to hit a very specific point off the coast of, uh, of the Florida and the Atlantic. And so uh, that time will, will vary based upon the trajectory of the ISS and the, and the Dragon as it comes down. In terms of the, the manual time periods versus the auto, automatic time periods, there are two uh, periods, as I mentioned, that are planned for manual control. One is uh, early on flight day one after the vehicle has launched and they've done the initial activations and checkouts. There is a period where the Dragon is essentially coasting as it tries to catch up with the space station. During that time, we expect there to be an opportunity to do this first part of the manual flying demonstration. There'll be a um, demonstration of the attitude control. So roll, pitch, yaw, making sure that those are working, but it's not actually gonna be changing the, the trajectory of the Dragon itself. It's really just orientation tests. And then the, the second time, and from that point, it'll continue its automated approach with the, with the burns uh, programmed both by the vehicle and by the, the ground controllers as it gets closer to ISS and it's within that you know, 170 to 220 meters or so from the space station, there'll be the uh, other manual flight test that is, uh, is performed by the crew flying. And then uh, those are really the only planned times, as we said, the, the crew has the capability to take over really and decide their own fate if, if, uh, if that was necessary to be able to perform a, a manual reentry, uh, splashdown. They have a lot of capabilities we've uh, vigorously tested with uh, all the systems from uh, guidance navigation control, uh, reentry, uh, parachute deployments, and so forth. Next up, we'll go to Leah Crane with New Scientist. Leah, are you there? I apologize. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. 
Okay, great. Um, hi, thank you for doing this. Um, I apologize that I have another corona question, um, which is how will the astronauts themselves be protected from infecting the ISS? Will they be quarantined for an extended period of time before the launch? Yeah, I, I can take that question. So, uh, so we've been going through uh, a number of precautions with Bob and Doug uh, as the coronavirus pandemic uh, has been in place for a few months. You know, we, we have sort of minimized contact with them for, uh, for weeks now to, to ensure that they have uh, less contact than, than most people would. Uh, they only come to certain training events where they really need to be present. A lot of training events are done virtually. And then the number of people at a particular training event is dramatically minimized. And then people in close proximity to Bob and Doug, you know, have a uh, mask and gloves and uh, to protect Bob and Doug. And also uh, they are screened uh, from a health perspective. Uh, they will go into a, a quarantine uh, for flight. Uh, right now, I think for May 27th, that quarantine starts uh, around May 16th. Uh, they would come on site here at JSC and be in the uh, crew quarters uh, facility. And then uh, they'll fly down on a NASA aircraft and be quarantined uh, down at uh, the Kennedy Space Center, just like we did for Space Shuttle and other launches. So we've got a robust plan in place to protect Bob and Doug and ensure they're, they're healthy when they go fly, and also that we protect the, the space station uh, crew members as well. Okay, we're going to take a question next from Joey Roulette from uh, uh, Reuters. Hey, thanks so much for doing this question for all. Um, after Starliner had its five-minute blackout with the Hedra satellite network during its OFT, um, has the Crew Dragon team taken any steps to prevent the same type of blackout from occurring? And then also for Steve, um, the specific mission duration is you know based on the readiness of the next commercial crew launch. Um, and I was wondering if it's also based on any other factors, and if so, what are those factors? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit about the uh, the OFT flight and the and the teeter outage. Uh, that that particular mission, the reason that we had a teeter outage was really not necessarily a network problem. It wasn't a problem with the teeter satellites or the network. It was it was really a problem with the, the time on board the Starliner spacecraft and th that time being off. And so Starliner really wasn't looking for the Teeter satellite in the right location. So we've done uh, enormous amount of testing with the Dragon to make sure that the Dragon spacecraft and the Falcon 9 launch vehicle don't have any of those problems. In fact, uh, the SpaceX team has done extra tests after that, that OFT mission. So we, we know that the Dragon spacecraft uh, knows how to find Teeters. In fact, it, it did that on the demonstration one mission back in March. So we don't really have any concerns there. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Uh, second part was whether the um, mission duration of Crew Dragon is based on any other factors other than um, the, the timing of the next commercial crew launch. No, really, again, it's based on two things. Is the spacecraft healthy? Uh, is it doing well? Uh, do we see any problems that, that we should return early based on how the spacecraft, the Dragon's performing? And then the second one really is when when is that next flight ready so we can we can really have our first full up crew rotation mission where we have four crew members coming up on crew one and, and go up to the full operational capability of Dragon. So it's really based on, based on those two things.